Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe. I'm going to be spending this video going through a past a uh, question from a previous paper one um, as we prepare for our natural uh, our national uh, final exams um, and essentially we're going to look at today the investigative question that they always include in final papers in both paper one and paper two and what we are looking at here today is in particular how they've taken the topic auxins and plant hormones and how they've built it into a investigative question. Now often investigative questions are based on some topic that you have done in paper one um, but they're quite abstract they're very difficult to prepare for because um, the investigation will be different every year it's not going to be something that they will repeat and often this is quite an abstract topic it's a topic that um a lot of people are wary of and afraid of because you can't predict what the question will be. It's important to have some good grounding knowledge that you would have acquired all the way through high school, like an AIM, hypothesis, independent, dependent variable, reliability, validity. But I'm going to unpack those today as we go through this question. Now, if you'd like to pause the video here so you can attempt the questions, please do so. Jot your answers down and let's see if you came to the same conclusions. At the end of the video, I'm going to post um, the memo so that you can go through it and mark your own answers. Okay, let's get into it. So, it's really important to spend some time reading this introductory paragraph and really unpacking it and knowing exactly what is going on and along with the diagram and the table that they have provided with us. So, starting at the very beginning, it says a group of grade 12 learners investigated and I really want you to pay attention here. It says the influence of different concentrations of auxins on plumal growth. Now, whether you know this or not, but they have just revealed to you the aim of the experiment. Perhaps the aim could also be worded as an investigation was conducted to determine, to see, to measure, um, and essentially that is the aim of this experiment. So we want to keep that in our back pocket because there's some, some important pieces of information that we can take out of that sentence and use to answer questions later. It says that a pumule is a young stem that grows from a seed and the procedure was as follows. They took 35 bean seeds and they were germinated, meaning they were starting to grow a small root and shoot. The seedlings were then divided into five groups of seven seedlings each. And it might help you to make a little sort of uh, sketch alongside your note, just so you can visualize this. We have five groups which means that effectively if I were to have dishes containing my seven seeds, I can have little dots here representing my seven seeds in each, just so we have a visual representation of what that would look like. It just allows you to unpack this a lot better, and I suggest you do the same. It then goes on to say that in each group, the seven seedlings were attached with press stick to filter paper on which a 10 by 10 meter grid was drawn. The filter paper with seedlings was then glued to the inside of a petri dish. So essentially what they're doing is they are taking these five dishes that I drew alongside here with the seven seeds in each. They've pressed it them down, which means they're going to be stuck to the side. They drew a grid on it, which means they essentially drew lines across it so that you could have a grid pattern running through it so that you can have like a grid reference. And then it says they were then attached to a petri dish. So now they're not just um, in groups on a piece of paper. They're now actually in a dish itself. It then goes on to say that each of these five petri dishes were placed in a beaker containing different con uh, concentrations of auxins. The diagram below shows the setup of a single beaker. So let's quickly make sure we understand what's going on here. So we've got our petri dish. We have our seedlings, our filter paper, our beaker, and our auxin solution. Now, if we look very carefully at these diagrams, and they're, they're quite small, so we need to get quite close, but we can actually see the individual seeds here. And um, we, if I just remove that so you can see them again, and we can see something growing out of them. We can see something perhaps going up, 
And we can also see a little something growing downwards. And maybe that might help us in one of our questions later on. It then goes on to say that all five beakers were placed in a dark cupboard for three days. Now, that's actually an important piece of information. They don't do that for nothing. They're not telling you that for nothing. And this is perhaps something you also learned in grade 11 as well about why we do this with plants. But let's move on. After three days, they increased in the length of each plumule was measured. In other words, after three days, the increase in the length was measured. So they wanted to see the difference. And we want to make a note of that because that's telling us what we're measuring. It then says the average increase in the length of plumule in each beaker was calculated and recorded in the table below. So let's unpack the table so we know what's happening inside the table. So we have beakers one, two, three, four, five which is over here, we have the auxin concentration in parts per million, and just by looking at it, we can see we're going from the lowest concentration to the highest concentration as we go down, and then average increase in plumial length by millimeters. Now, I would like you to pay a little bit of attention to this, and I want you to know what's happening here, because tables often reveal the trend, or we can say they reveal the relationship between the variables. In other words, the trend would be, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it staying the same? What is the trend? What is the relationship? Now, in this instance here, there seems to be an increase in length as we go and approach 10 parts per million. But then we get to 10 parts per million here in the middle, and we get to our highest amount. And then it seems that as we progress in the amount of parts per million in the auxin, which we're looking at over here now, you will see that it seems to be decreasing in amount. In other words, the average premial length gets longer the more we increase the auxin, but then we get to what I would want to call the peak amount that you can use, the optimum amount, and then it seems to decrease in length after that in the 50 parts per million and the 100 parts per million. So now let's look at some of the first questions. So let's have a look at 3, 2, 1. It says, for this investigation, identify the independent and the dependent variable. Now, you should always be taking these two variables not from the table. I know that there are some of you out there that do this, and maybe some of your teachers have said that you should do this. This is such a bad practice because some tables have many variables inside of them. A clear example of a confusing variable for some students is this first column over here, the beaker number. A lot of teachers will say, oh, you just take the first column on the left and the first row on the right, and that will give you your independent and dependent, and that is not true. Because the beaker number is just that, a beaker number. It is a fixed thing. It is not one of these variables. And so the independent and dependent variable is actually going to be taken from the very beginning here in this opening statement. And that's why I wanted you to make a note of it. Because it says we want to inf investigate the influence of different concentrations of auxins on plumial growth. This gives us our two variables. The different concentrations of auxins is going to be our independent variable because it's the variable we choose to manipulate and change. And the dependent variable comes from the plumial growth because we don't know that outcome. We just know that they're going to grow. But how much are they going to grow? We're not sure. And so that's where we take our independent and our dependent variables from. Then let's go into 322. It says state the purpose of the grid that was placed inside each of the petri dishes. Now it's only for one mark, so a state question is very short and easy. Now, the answer we're looking at is actually very straightforward. Uh, we are using grid paper, which, if we're unfamiliar, is where we have sort of a grid like this. And we will assume, perhaps, that the distance between the two lines drawn is always going to be the same um, in centimeters. So let's say one block and every block is one centimeter. So these grids allow us to see how far something has grown. So if our seed was sitting 
on the grid paper, we can see how far up our shoot is growing by how many grids it has crossed. I know I haven't drawn this out very well, but you're getting the idea. That would be one centimeter. Here would be the other centimeter. Here would be the next centimeter. So it allows us to measure. Now, if we move to the top of the page here, I'm just going to fit all the questions on the same side. Let's go on to 323. It says, explain why the beakers were placed in a dark cupboard. Now, this is for two marks. And any explain question is always asking how and why. So, in other words, we are going to say they were put in the cupboard. Well, why were they put in the cupboard? And then how in putting them in the cupboard, is this going to influence our experiment? Well, there's two answers here to go with. The first one, I think, is the more obvious one that perhaps links into your grade 11 work um, on photosynthesis, which is, if you're putting a seed in a dark place, you are allowing the seed to grow in its natural conditions, which would be underground. In other words, you are removing the light and you are allowing the seed to grow under its normal conditions therefore allowing the auxins that are present to stimulate growth without the light affecting the outcome of the growth. You could also say something like to expose them to a uniform amount of light which means the same amount or in this case no light um, in order to make sure that your results are valid. That's an either-or answer, but you'll see how the memo plays out when we get to it. Let's go on into the next question. For 324, it says, state one way in which learners ensured the reliability. Now, this is actually a tricky question if you don't read it properly. A lot of people see the word reliability, and they give a set answer. Now, I'm going to remind you what reliability is, just so that we know the difference between reliability and validity. So, reliability is referring to things like, we are going to repeat the experiment. In other words, we're going to do it again. Or, we are going to increase the sample size. In other words, if we used 100 Animals, we are now going to use maybe a thousand sample size. And then the third and final one, I'm just going to remove my validity here so we can see it. The third and final reliability one is to calculate an average. Okay, now those are the set ones that you can use, but I'm going to show you which ones you can use for this answer and which ones maybe you should avoid. Now, if that is reliability, I want to go into what is validity, which is often the two that are confused. Now, validity refers to variables, and we are trying to keep the variables the same. In other words, they need to stay constant, and um, we would use things like the same uh, pH, the same temperature, the same species, the same amount, the same time, the same, same. You're very um, uh, lucky that you could use the word the same, and it just validates your answer a lot better. But now, let me tell you why this question is tricky, because you have to read it really carefully. It says, state one way in which the learners ensured the reliability. In other words, how did they make sure that they were being reliable? That means you cannot just pick any one of these three and write it down. You have to take the one that they actually did from the paragraph. Luckily for us, there's actually two. So, did they repeat the experiment? That's what you ask yourself the question. Is that the one we're going to write down? No, they did not. So we cannot write simply repeat the experiment because we have to use one that they actually used in the paragraph. So we go back to the paragraph and we look at, okay, 
So they didn't repeat it. Did they increase the sample size? The answer, yes, they did, because they used five groups of seven seedlings each, which we can see up here. Next one, did they calculate an average? Well, yes, they did, because if we look at our very last bullet point down here, it tells us that an average was calculated. Now, the answer is only looking for one of those two, but you have to give one from the paragraph. And then uh, let's look at 325. State three factors not indicated in the procedure that should be kept constant during this investigation. So that means you can't use anything that's already in here. It means that you have to come up with your own. Now, what's interesting is they just said that this was a bean experiment, but they didn't tell you what kind of bean. So that's definitely one of the factors you could include. So what did they not include in this experiment? They didn't tell us that they used the same beans. So we can write that down. Use the same species or the same type of bean. They also didn't tell us the different ages of the beans. They didn't tell us that they were all at the same stage of growth. So that can also be another one that we can include. They also never mentioned any other environmental conditions they kept the same. They never said that they kept the same amount of water, the same amount of pH. And so those are another two more that we could mention. And so it's a state answer, so it's just one word answers, or should I say phrases, even if it's two or three words, it's not long sentences. And last but not least, it says state the conclusion that can be made from the results in the table. And we spoke about this right at the beginning of the video. That's where we're looking for the trend or the relationship between the amount of auxins and the average increase in length. And that's where we're going to say that. As the auxin concentration increases, so does the pumule length. However, it meets its optimum at 10 parts per million. And then pumule length decreases after that. Now I'm going to share with you the memo for this particular question. I want you to go through it. I want you to make yourself familiar with it. Perhaps go back again and listen to some of the video to just make sure that you're very clear on this. And if you like this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I will constantly be posting up new videos on different topics, different questions all the time. Um, so see you next time. Bye.